I guess I'll do a combination of talking to you, the people here in the audience, which the, uh, is a packed house basically here. here so just going to be distracted, focusing mostly on the people in the audience, but I'll also try to check in with the folks at home. And uh, I can say welcome, right? And this is, uh, my name is Zach Ruda and I am with Rewild Maine and we are here uh, at the MacArthur Library in Biddeford in collaboration with the Biddeford Gardens as part of their garden series. And uh, I'm gonna be giving a talk about rewilding urban space. And I'll say, I guess I should say briefly that Re uh, Rewild Maine is uh, an educational nonprofit program series. Uh, so we facilitate a variety of classes and workshops for children and adults in Southern Maine. And they're focused on what we call um, small scale place based living skills. So it's a lot of organic arts and crafts and amateur botany and biology and plant study. Uh, but it might be broadly referred to as rewilding classes, not that rewilding is should be limited only to what the classes that we teach, because I'm going to try to explore it as a larger concept. Um, but usually at the beginning of every program, we take a moment to say thank you. Um, so I want to say thank you to everybody who's here listening. If there's folks at home or maybe you're going to be watching this later. Uh, thank you for coming. And I also am grateful to the library for hosting us, MacArthur Library. Uh, so we should expand the circle of gratitude to include them as well. But and we could we could be here all night expanding the circle, expanding the circle and thanking the wind and the rocks and the willows and all the forces that came together um, and acknowledging all the all the history that's happened to lead to this point for each of us. But well, that would take a long time, but we should at least acknowledge that although we're here in the MacArthur Library, well, like we're on your land, this is the library property, you know, um, the land that we're on is actually older than the library itself and older even than the town of Biddeford or the town of Portland or the state of Maine or the country. Uh, so I want to say the magic sentence, which is to acknowledge that this is the traditional territory of Wabanaki peoples, uh, but not only just to say the magic sentence, but really to kind of acknowledge, you know, the history that it took to displace those people to make way for the world that we have here. Uh, and also to set the context for what we're talking about now and the, the classes that we teach. I mean, we teach people how to make, you know, this is a basket. I brought a few crafts. This is just stuff that I have anyway. This is my backpack, but this is an invasive species basket, right? And so um, the things that we're doing seem small, like making a basket or the, the amount of invasive species that it took to make this basket is small, but we're touching something much larger, right? And we should humble ourselves at least for a moment to acknowledge the context that we find ourselves in. Sometimes I think about it as we're like fumbling through the darkness together with humility, trying to find a way to live without destroying everything, which is no small task. So, um, yeah, and that's that's a general introduction. You know, there's more. There's always more that I could say about Rewild Maine, and I, I will kind of touch on what we're doing as an organization in this talk. Um, but as far as rewilding urban space, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about rewilding, what it is, um, the origins of the term, the different interpretations of the concept of rewilding, and of course, specifically try to fit it into an urban context. Uh, whereas it might look different, <clears throat> excuse me, there, there's, there's, of course, different understandings of maybe rewilding the Amazon rainforest would look different from rewilding urban space. So. so this is this chart that I've made, and I started with a little timeline, which we can run through really quickly, and I hope maybe you can read it at home, but it's a timeline that says uh, basically the evolution of life, right? And maybe this is common knowledge for people or maybe it's a really nice reminder but i think when we're talking about rewilding as a concept it's worth starting with a little bit of zooming out of what is the re you know is we could just be like wilding could just be wilding out 
uh, but there's rewilding. So there's some sort of assumption that there's something that we're trying to re re reclaim or reconnect with. But it's just nice to remember that it's for, uh, oh, it's not 450 billion years. This is wrong. 4.5. But 4.5 billion years is a long time for Earth, 3.5 3 billion years for life. So the billion years, I can't even I can't even take the time to understand what that means, but it's a lot, right? So a very long time ago, the Earth happened. Then life appeared. Um, but the thing that where, where this chart really gets interesting for me is that 2.8 million years ago, that's the first genus Homo. That's the first human ancestor, pre-humans. And what's really interesting, um, well, one thing that's interesting about ancient humans, pre-human ancestors, is that some of the oldest stone tools that we find are from around this time, two and a half, three million years ago, right? And so that just blows my mind to think that long before we were humans, this is like Homo erectus and Homo ergaster and Australopithecus and Neanderthals and all these uh, pre-humans, they had stone tools and it's hard to make a stone tool it's not it's no easy feat you know uh so and and of course all the other artifacts baskets leather right every this is stitched with uh animal sinew so all of these things would rot away the stone the stone is the only artifact that doesn't decompose and so what's crazy about the the ancient pre-humans making stone tools three three million years ago two and a half million years ago is that they probably had other forms of technology they probably had like baskets and leather and um it's escaping me now the first earliest evidence of fire but fire is 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 far back there as well uh and so the notion is that we've been we've been crafting with our hands uh for for longer even than we've been human beings but anatomically modern humans start to appear around 200,000 years ago, which that's another mind blower as well. Because I didn't think, a lot of times if you ask people how old are humans, they will say, anybody want to, do you know how old, well, I already told you. <laughs> but sometimes when you ask kids, they will say, and you, you, maybe you've heard this number, 10,000, right? Sometimes people, and sometimes they'll say, how old is the earth? It's, it's 6,000 years old. But uh, <laughs> some people do think that humans are about 10,000 years old, but actually 10,000 years ago is the Neolithic revolution. That's like the first civilizations. That's the agricultural revolution. And that's, there is actually, a, there is some earlier evidence. I was just reading this, uh, The Dawn of Everything, David Graeber, which is an amazing text that I didn't write down. I wrote some other books on this thing, but that was a good one, David Graeber. And uh, of course, there is some evidence in the historical record for human settlements, even human settlements with uh, like large scale sharing or maybe trade. Like they got this settlement here and they got rocks from over here and rocks from over there. And the rocks that they find at this settlement here don't naturally occur here at the settlement. So the only way they could find rocks from here and there at this place is if they were brought from the hither and yon people for trading. And that's from like 30,000 years ago. So there is evidence of human settlements before the Neolithic revolution, but for the vast majority, um, 200,000 years ago, we were anatomically modern. So if we had a language machine, we could go back in time and connect with those ancient peoples. And they're not, <clears throat> you know, they're not dumb. They're not any less smart than than we are uh so it's fascinating to think about this hundred and ninety thousand years of existence as human beings with the mental capacity that we have smart enough to build a rocket ship right we were smart enough to build rocket ships for 190,000 years but didn't start on a large scale and maybe there's answers to this maybe there's climate or whatever i don't want to spend too much time on this page because we're kind of here in the modern world and we we have job to do in the modern world, but it's important to remember, uh, 10,000 years ago, this is basically the beginning of everything that we know. And a lot of times when people talk about human nature, they say like, uh, 
a lot of times people say like human nature and then their evidence for human nature is modern society they'll say like humans are greedy because like look around <laughs> like obviously you know but i kind of want to remember that not only is all of america kind of american society and then there's western society which is like even bigger than america but there kind of is like a shared culture of people who like shop at the market and in that sense we kind of are like the same culture as north korea and iran and saudi arabia and russia we're all kind of the same culture in that sense and then different cultures would be like the myriad of people who don't shop at the market, who get their food in a million other ways. It's almost like all of civilizations are one group, but it's not like all hunter-gatherers are another group. It's almost like hunter-gatherers are like a million different groups with all this crazy cultural variation. And then there's this similarities that can be drawn between all of the market going money makers, you know, the money inventing. They still got money in Iran, you know, it's different culturally, but in, in that sense, it's the same. So all that stuff started really recently in the grand scheme of things, 10,000 years ago. And then it wasn't until 4.6 thousand years ago that we started keeping written records. So we basically forgot all of this and think that it's just like Flintstones time, you know, <laughs> Captain Caveman or something. 250, 250 years ago was the Industrial Revolution. And, uh, you know, there's a lot to be said about specialization of labor and, and evolution of society and the birth of inequality and, you know, Upton Sinclair and all of that nonsense, the Luddites, right? I think that the Industrial Revolution is a really interesting, uh, it's interesting for me because, we, I, well, I said industry here, I, I really should have written industrial revolution because I'm often making the argument that industry, industrialism began back here with the agricultural revolution. Hello, welcome. Hi. Uh, but I think that the industrial revolution was not really the birth of anything. It was just kind of a synthesis and an acceleration of processes that had already been set in motion 10,000 years ago. But a lot of people say, you know, nobody says that. Nobody says in the 1500s, everything was great everybody was racially diverse and nice to each other and kind and there was no exploitation of women or or uh other races and there was no inequality and nobody says that so only 50 years ago we had the internet in 15 years and now we have all this alienation and the iphone i mean i think i mean look at all of the craziness that's happened and now we can't go anywhere you can't even find your way home i mean where are you? Sure. The names of the roads. Yeah. So it's just important to keep that in mind. So then we're kind of talking about this doesn't say rewilding. Maybe this should say rewilding at the top, but uh, this is kind of an overview. We're, we're we haven't really gotten to rewilding yet, but we're still kind of talking about what is maybe what is wildlife or what is wildness or an, an, an examination of that. Sounds, I, like, I, sounds like a prep party. <laughs> we're not we haven't gotten fully wild uh, yeah we're headed there uh so i just thought this was really interesting that the eden this is like a fun fact do you guys know this eden do you know that what the truth is Sumer, do you know the, do you know sumerian don't you know a little Sumer from ghostbusters <laughs> do they have that sumerian and ghostbusters forget that i don't remember that scene <laughs> this is apparently an uh Sumerian word, Eden, and it means step or plain, step like uh, S-T-E-P-P-E, -P -P -E, like a steppy, yeah, so, uh, or an open plain. And so it's interesting to think that Eden kind of was like an ancient word for wilderness. Like if we're going to go out to the big field, we're going out to Eden, you know, and it's almost like when you go out to the woods, there you are in Eden, and uh, there is a lot of scholarly research to support the notion that the the modern religious understanding of the Garden of Eden was so named because it was a derivative of this. So that's just interesting, I think. Yeah.
When it comes to the word wild, um, there's been some examination by some people. Um, a lot of my work is in, heavily influenced by a guy named Peter Michael Bauer, who uh, is the founder of, he wrote a book called Rewild or Die, and is the founder of Rewild Portland, which, uh, with which Rewild Maine is uh, not officially related, but closely affiliated and strongly inspired by and modeled after. Good question. Peter Michael Bauer. And this was an idea that was actually first explored by this guy, Miles Olson, who wrote this book, Unlearn and Rewild, or Unlearn, Rewild, just a comma. Um, and who knows if it's really true or not. You know, etymology is a fun thing, but Miles is playing with this idea that, and we're not really sure if it's true or not, but it, it doesn't matter either way, because the idea is that uh, wild maybe etymologically is derived from willed. You know, this has a share of similarity with the notion of free will or some being or place that has its own will or its own nature. Uh, and so perhaps the Garden of Eden or the wilderness or the wild place is just nature doing its thing. Nature living for nature, right? Uh, and we have this idea of nature as kind of unvarnished or unblemished or unadulterated by human hands or human activity or behavior, which I don't think, actually, the more we learn about uh, indigenous people's history, uh, that's not true, right? It's not like, it's not true that indigenous peoples all around the world were just kind of like, in the nature, not touching anything, just don't mess, you know, they were making decisions, right? They were making a lot of decisions. So, uh, so it's nice to think about this concept as the wilderness as like a place with its own free will. Uh, but I don't know if that necessarily means that rewilding is just like turning our back on nature, turning our back on like the patch of land behind the Home Depot and just saying like, well, all right, whatever happens back there, it's gonna be completely eaten by wild rose and bittersweet and autumn olive, but we're just gonna let it rewild. I think that there might be more to it than that. Uh, but when it comes to wildlife, like um, how we might've been living for those 190,000 years that I think is so fascinating and, and interesting, uh, a lot of the principles that may be, you know, may be used to tie together all those different variations among hunter-gatherer societies. Uh, it would be really hard. It would be really hard to tie them all together because it's two hundred thousand years or millions of years of human evolution, and there's a lot of variation. So there's some societies that do this, and there's some societies that do the other thing, right? But what they do have in common, perhaps. Uh, and this has been explored in this book that I'm going to mention, Tending the Wild. But what they do have in common, perhaps, all of these ancient uh, pre-civilization societies or these wild societies or whatever, you know, I'm trying to not be patronizing with it. But what they might have in common is that they all have their own form of this traditional ecological knowledge. Are you all familiar with this term? Great. Good. OK, so I'm not like boring you here. It's new <laughs> stuff, right? Cool. So. This book is amazing, you know, and I only have a short time here just giving a short talk and it's an intro an overview and maybe there's some people for a lot of this might be new information. So I'm kind of just going to run through it. But if you want to explore it more, this Tending the Wild, the author is M. Cat Anderson, and that's a great book. And it was kind of adapted. Um, not really, but there is a there's a YouTube video by that same name, Tending the Wild, that is not really an, an adaptation of the book, but it's. It's very closely, it's like the same idea. So if you want to start with the free YouTube video, Tending the Wild, or check out the book. Um, and this Tending the Wild really is an exploration of the traditional ecological knowledge of uh, various indigenous peoples of what is now known as California. And so this book, Tending the Wild, unfortunately, uh, doesn't have a lot to do with the Northeast because it's a lot of California, right? 
There's another book that I didn't write down that's a little older now, uh, Changes in the Land. I think the author is William Croton, C-R-O-T-O-N. That's actually his about uh, specifically ecological changes in the this region of the land, Northeast, North America, United States, or Turtle Island. And uh, but tending the wild is better, I think. So this is about traditional ecological knowledge is basically, you know, it is what it sounds like, but it's it's um, how indigenous peoples all around the world, and it's just because this book is written about California, doesn't mean that the principles described therein are limited to California, obviously, right? So people, all place-based peoples or indigenous peoples, peoples who were indigenous to that place, all around the world have their different types of traditional ecological knowledge. And all it is, is the ways that indigenous peoples interacted with the land. And the more that we study them like less racistly, you know, the, the whole field of anthropology, this, I learned this in college when I was studying anthropology, but the whole field of anthropology underwent essentially like a huge revolution in the 1970s and is undergoing another revolution now, right? With this whole kind of like decolonizing methodologies and just questioning our place and our, uh, what is that? Unquestioned biases and unbiased assumptions and all of that stuff, right? So, uh, somehow that was supposed to be a sentence <laughs> it's just it's just supposed to you know it's just to understand that place-based peoples had different ways of interacting with the earth and as right that's it as we learn more about indigenous peoples we're learning that the ways they interacted with the earth was not so much hands off Right. And maybe if there's indigenous peoples listening to this, right? I mean, there's, there's a small, small number of people in the rooms, but I don't want to assume your identity. But uh, for, for plenty of indigenous peoples, this whole thing might be like a duh. You know, I don't know if you ever heard this uh, Red Earth, White Lies, uh, Vine Deloria, or I don't know if it's pronounced Vine Deloria or Vinnie Deloria, an author. But, you know, there's this idea about how, like, uh, this scientific study came out that found out that if you like pipe the pipe music into the greenhouse, that the plants grow better. They like, give them some nice music to listen to, and the plants respond to that energy. And uh, you know that's something that indigenous peoples have been trying to tell us for thousands of years, right? Or, or at least hundreds of years of since contact European contact. But then it had to be proven in the laboratory under the study, right? And then we're able to accept it. And so it's just it's worth acknowledging how ironic it is that we need like scientific studies and these textbooks to believe what indigenous people have kind of been trying to tell us since there was contact between and it's not even about european contact with native americans or not native americans but first nations turtle island people it's about the contact between civilized people and indigenous people every time they met right and uh yeah, of course, it, it, it's, it's been the story of the past 10,000 years. Uh, so without going too much into it, I think that wildlife for those 190,000 years before we developed uh, industrial systems and written record and irrigation, uh, well, not irrigation, you know, maybe there were forms of irrigation because uh, it's, I think that what we were doing for those 190,000 years was around the world, whether we lived in a hot weather place or a cold weather place or up or down, we were developing this traditional ecological knowledge that allowed us to interact with the natural world in a regenerative way, mm -hmm. right? So that's the, that's the key word, but that, that, that word is gonna come later, but I'll just mention this book, Braiding Sweetgrass, because she, um, a lot of people have read this book before, but it's like a super popular book, but if you haven't read it, it's when you read it, you realize, oh, this is why it's such a great book, because it's, it's a classic. And uh, she talks a lot about, um, the overlap between traditional ecological knowledge and industrial botanical knowledge. And uh, she talks a lot about, I mean, it's an amazing book, but there's, I just remember that one story from the book. I didn't bring like, anything with cattails, but I have a cattail hat and I almost brought, and uh, just to show. She talks about the name for cattails. You know, we know this plant cattails, like, oh, it looks like a kitty cat tail, I guess. Looks like a cattail. Or we call some people know it as like the corn dog plant. Ha uh ha, -huh, looks like a corn dog. Have you read this book? 
braiding sweetgrass? Oh, yes. But you have. Yeah. So I'll just tell you this one. She's, and I, I don't want to try to like, I don't remember what the, what, I think that she's uh, Anishinaabe maybe. And, and if I got it wrong, you know, forgive me, but I'll have to go and check. But I don't want to, I don't remember what in her people's language, what the word is that it sounds like. But she offers this translation or the, you know, her people's native name for the plant that we call cattail. In her language, it's like, you know, the, the bees and this wrong, you know, but uh, but what it is, the meaning is uh, we wrap the baby in it. That's the translation, because cattail makes this fluff that they would use to stuff their baby cradles and baby blankets because it's so soft and insulative. And, warm and cozy oh. and she goes on this book you know it's funny because like i'll stumble over words or like feel like i do an awkward land acknowledgement or feel like i said something like accidentally racist or insensitive or whatever and like look at the camera or feel like oh who could be watching but i think a lot of this stuff is about the context and this book you know you could hang me for saying something wrong if i like said the wrong thing um but i couldn't read this book in public because it was like tears yes like uh, everything that she says, like that was, and she talks about how different it is if you drive by cattails and you see, I mean, some people see like an invasive species, you know, cattails. Um, yeah, they're not anyway, the invasive, this is the next step. That's next, next subject. But just imagine the difference between cattails or wrap the baby. we wrap the baby in it, this plant that you had this when you were an infant you had this relationship with them yeah so just pretend that this whole talk is just you reading these books and then i don't have then it doesn't matter if i said the wrong thing it's like that's the message there <laughs> uh, but it's so i wrote just wrote down dow orion because the title of of their book is a little longer and it's beyond the war on invasive species but if you just write down dow orion and go and look up the book Beyond the War on Invasive Species, we'll find it. And uh, I just wrote this down because a lot of what I'm kind of teasing, you know, there's there's so much of, of uncivilized or indigenous peoples it's all around the world, different cultures. I can't talk about what the cultures were like. Or, all I'm really talking about is how they related to the earth, right? And was it wild or not? I, or or in, in the case of, did it promote the free will of the place? And uh, and in the case of this tending the wild and braiding sweetgrass, they're making decisions for the plants. They're picking, they're pruning, they're burning, they're planting things that they want. You know, they're managing. Um, I forget where it was. If it was tending the wild or this changes in the land, where I read about, uh, you know, one of the early colonists when they came to North America, they they wrote about a forest you could ride your horse through. Which I just think is so interesting. A forest you could ride a horse through. If you know the forest in the Northeast now, if you go off trail, it's like you're getting poked in the face instantly, right? There's no forest you could ride a horse through. And so they used to be oak savannas, right? It used to be like tended forests. And sometimes I joke about this. How do you, who, who uses dead wood? What sort of wild animal really likes dead wood? Sometimes people say beavers, but beavers often cut down live trees too, and beavers will use all sorts of stuff. But you know who really likes dead wood? People. People collect the dead wood for their uh, fires or for their shelters or for tools or, or carving. So this braiding sweetgrass and tending the wild is just acknowledging that in this traditional ecological knowledge, people were making decisions for wild nature, uh, even cultivating plants, right? For, for people, too. Like, maybe not even selfishly. I don't know if it was selfishly or not. I think that's the key, right? Is are we promoting the will of the nature? I mean, plenty of, plenty of place-based people's religions uh, required them to be a good steward of the earth, you know, because their, their belief structure is like, well, we crawled out of this mountain. Like, this mountain birthed us. We're staying here. You know, this river... Like the first people in the timeless time, they crawled out of this river. You're not polluting this river. That's where people come from, you know? So 
those are about um, those are about maybe prehistoric time or pre-contact or pre-civilization or pre-colonialism. But this beyond the war on invasive species is just worth mixing. If you're going to read these two, you should mix it with Dow Orion beyond the war, because so much of where we are in the modern context is like we can't turn our back on the Home Depot. We can't turn our back on the wild spaces because I already mentioned, but they're going to they're they're snarled with invasive species. You know, there's uh, there's the invasive green crab. You know, there's there's all sorts of uh, there's the the algae, you know, the I forget what it's called, that the algal bloom or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Red tide. Thank you. Yes, all that stuff, you know, so there's it's not enough to basically just say it's not enough to just like stop causing harm. You know, because if, if we just like drop the rains now, we're like, oh, we were polluting. You know, we polluted. OK, let's stop polluting. You know, if we just let it go now, I don't think the answer is like stop managing natural spaces. A lot of times people's uh, assumption of rewilding. You know, and this is like before we even started the talk, I didn't really go into it. But like a lot of times people go into rewilding and they just think like, oh, let it go. You know, we were talking about no mo may, which no mo may is awesome, right? No mo may is like letting it go and letting whatever's wild happen. But you did talk about how and you let it you let it stay because there was a little frog there. But you talked about how we were talking about no mo may, and there's an instinct to after some time, start to clean it up a little bit, and you're not going to mow it all down. Maybe you create pollinator spaces in your garden, you know, but I do think that humans have a place in managing the earth, and so I don't think that rewilding is just, it wouldn't be like no mow forever again, you know, or maybe if it's even, maybe it's like scythe instead of mow, or maybe it's hand weeding instead of mow, but it's not hands off forever. So that's just, it's worth reading this Dow Orion because it's very like modern age. We're dealing with modern problems that, that we're not, not, I don't have a watch. There's a clock right there. Oh, great. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not that much more. So, in, you know, these are just, I can say this. Um, all of this is about, I think, an embrace of natural systems. You know, a lot of people talk about permaculture and maybe permaculture could be criticized or maybe we could talk about permaculture without even talking about permaculture. But I think it's just making decisions for the land with an embrace of natural systems. And it's possible that we could be doing this already. It's possible that we're, you know, changing farming practices to have more of an embrace of natural systems. But if we aren't, then we surely should be. Uh, and I just this I'm not going to really expand on this too much because I I want to kind of move my talk forward here. But uh, people do talk about human nature a lot of times, and some people talk about like um, human nature. You know, they'll say like, "Oh, well, ants do it." <laughs> they'll be like, "Well, bees do it." Ants and bees, you know, bees make a big empire. Can't we do it? You know, but we're not obviously ant. Ant civilization and bee civilization and human civilization look totally different, right? There's a lot of specific differences that are not even worth spending the time going through. Um, and then I was also going to talk about kind of uh, ecological fitness, about how people say, like, not only is it human nature to build things like ants and bees, but it's human nature to dominate. Or like uh, the lobster. The lobsters do it. You know, I don't know if you heard the lobster thing. I have not. Okay. You know what I'm talking about? No. <laughs> no, but I want to hear it now. Yeah, the lobster. Anyway, <laughs> the lobster. I'll have to. Uh, but dominating lobsters. <laughs> I think I will just say this and then I'll flip to the next page that there's a misunderstanding of human nature that goes back to that thing about humans are greedy because look around. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's false to assume that humanity is synonymous with civilization, right? Human nature is incredibly varied and uh, humans, I forget the name of the scientific term, but it's like human babies take a long time to develop, you know, like a tiger, little kitty cat tiger is ready to go, right? Hunting, killing, goodbye, mom, off to be a tiger, right? But humans are not like that. Humans, you need to raise them until they're at least 
five or 10 or 15 or 35, who knows, right? But by the time a human is like five or 10, old enough to like take care of their body without drowning or dying, you know, by the time they're seven, they're enculturated. So there's no like raw human nature. You can't like run an experiment. Like, let's see what humans do. If we just let it go, it's going to be like, it's going to not make it. It's not going to be good. Not going to be pretty. So human nature doesn't exist, basically. It's not necessarily human nature to be just like lobsters or whatever. And, uh, and animality, you know, survival of the fittest. I'll just say this, that, that people think about survival of the fittest as like only the strong survive, but it's actually about survival of the best fit, right? Whoever fits, it's not like the best fitness, right? It's the best like fitting fitness, you know, fitting in. So humanity is to be an animal, you know, it's weird that we have this whole humanism kind of separating humans from animals. And there's a whole exploration of what is human nature or what is animality or what does it mean to be an animal or to embrace our animal nature, you know, that I'm not going to go into this the interest of time, but we could go into another time. Great. Right, so this is what it really is. So if rewilding is, you know, in a sense, it's embracing traditional ecological knowledge. And in another sense, and I didn't even really, well, we're kind of coming at this from a variety of directions. We're, 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 we're approaching from a variety of perspectives to gain a, an integrated understanding, right? Looking at it from all the angles. So I'm kind of sneaking up on the, the ultimate punchline here, but uh, not only is rewilding embracing or kind of reconnecting with some form of traditional ecological knowledge or at least some form of effective regenerative ecological knowledge uh it's also taking responsibility for the fact that for the past ten thousand years duh like we haven't really been doing that you know we've, we've kind of i mean there's mono cropping monocultural farming is a big problem there's global movements you know there's like uh exploitation and colonialism of other people and natural resources and drying up the river and dumping garbage into the river and moving these invasive species around that you know it's not like plants didn't naturally move i mean there's a coconut but african swallow could carry a coconut african or european swallow you know could carry a coconut across the ocean but the movement of the invasive species that has been enacted by colonialism certainly happened way more quickly and it wasn't necessarily you know if the swallows carrying the coconut or whatever plants are naturally moving maybe that happens over a period of thousands of years and then you realize oh there the people make this argument they're like oh well plants naturally move you know they do naturally move but we moved a lot of plants really quickly so we have to acknowledge that we're rewilding an urban space. And I kind of already talked about some of these things. I haven't talked about this yet, but I, I, I do want to briefly just mention the origins of the word rewilding is kind of twofold. Uh, and if you look it up, there's consensus. It's only supposed to be an hour, right? So I'm going to have to well, speed it up. I think it's I can finish this one. It's all good. good. I'm going to finish it's all good. Okay, so um it's jam-packed okay so uh origins of rewilding so if you look it up there is general consensus about who coined it first but uh there's still argument about everything so the general consensus is that the first person to coin the term rewilding was i believe a man named jesse hardin uh and was a member of the anarchist radical organization called earth first worth looking up oh, yeah love them. go look it up <laughs> yeah uh so uh rewilding came from earth first and when he wrote about it uh i forget the name of the essay but uh you can look it up but it was in kind of like a socio-political context kind of like a social critique which is kind of the lens that i am coming from uh, but just as quickly, I believe the guy's name is Dave Foreman. I think I have these names memorized. Uh, Dave Foreman wrote a paper about rewilding, and this was in an ecological conservationist lens. And 
Both of these, I think, were like late 80s, maybe early 90s. It's completely irrelevant. So maybe I got that wrong, but it's it's in that realm, right? 80s, 90s. Um, and it was the birth of kind of two understandings of the word rewilding. One of them is, as I said, like a uh, social social critique, kind of political critique, and uh, maybe even like a in an anarchist lens, kind of like an anti-establishment lens. And the other one is uh, basically purely in the realm of uh, conservation ecology. And so when you talk to some people, and this is really big in Europe, like most of the people who I know in the rewilding world in Europe got into rewilding from this kind of conservationist edge. And, um, and it's certainly not bad or good. It, well, it's not, anyway. Uh, yes, please. Did they do it from a, a random kind of perspective, or did they they uh, they had a specific intent? I'm going to put uh, uh, like uh, mugwort here, and I'm going to put another form of artemisia here, and uh, uh, to serve a certain function. Right. Great question. Right. So when we think, uh, I think that when people are approaching rewilding from a conservationist lens. And not only is this big in Europe, but it is big in, among many people in this region, you know, and there's other there are other organizations in the area who talk about the word rewilding. And it's basically purely from a ecological management lens. Right. It's about planting mugwort or artemisia or putting native plants in the right place. And uh, I think sometimes, well, this is going to sound like. I don't even know if I want to. <laughs> oh, no. I have to go forward with this because this is the thought, and it's a good way to illustrate this point. But I'm in no way comparing other rewilding conservationist rewilding organizations to the Nazis. Okay, let's wait till I see how I follow this up. But the Nazis had this understanding that they were going to uh, recreate the ancient form of the oxen. Have you ever heard of this? The auroch. I mean, the Nazis were all about, in a sense, they were kind of about like they had almost the similar understanding of, of ancient society is, as I'm not at all. It was an extinct uh, oxen. It was an extinct oxen that they thought was the ultimate form of oxen. And it was before human civilization started messing it all up. So they went back in the historical record and they said, this was the peak of wild oxen. And then they tried to rebreed modern cows to kind of become or not become because there was no way to do that but they tried to make modern cows like look like this auroch this their understanding of like the perfect thing and so that's why i'm so embarrassed by even using this conversation um this comparison because it's always kind of like a trigger emotionally triggering comparison and i'm not saying that when we try to put native plants there that we're being um Mugwort, by the way, I think is an invasive plant, right? So not native. Artemisia, I believe, is a non-native. Well, uh, it's Artemisia is uh, contains mugwort, contains white sage, contains uh, the sage. The, there's there's several other. Some of them are native, and some of them aren't. But I I guess what I'm saying is like, if we were to try to pick some time that was like pre-contact or pre-globalization or pre-colonialism and try to say that that was the perfect point in history, I almost am afraid that we're like missing the point. You know, I think the point is um, focusing on uh, where we're at, you know, and uh, moving forward and just thinking of the theme of regeneration, right? And healing the land, healing our, each other, healing ourselves, uh, and and finding a way to live without ecological destruction. So I don't know if I'm answering your question or not. Yeah, well, there is. Uh, I don't know if that's rewilding or not. I don't know if gardening is rewilding. I think it's good to plant things that will attract pollinators, yeah. and it's good to do invasive species and all that. But it's important to, and we're we're doing this. We're moving through this page. But it's important to recognize that there's two understandings of rewilding, and one of them is about managing ecology and the other one is kind of questioning our place in the world i think it's more so it's our place in the universe mm. it's that we know now that okay. there is consciousness in all living things right okay and um are we acting 
with the universe when we take a like mugwort seeds or whatever type of plant we're acting in unison with that consciousness and saying okay i want to be planted over here right that kind of thing well that's yeah i mean there's a beautiful definition of love scott peck says that love is the willingness to extend your energy for the spiritual growth of another you know so like if i'm willing to give my energy to help you grow yeah that's an act of love baby that's what it is and so if we're doing that if we're kind of tapping in, we don't want to be arrogant or egotistical with it. We don't want to, I don't want to say, I know what's best for you, plant, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but if we're kind of tapping into that, what we think is the willed, the wild nature of Eden or the wilderness or whatever. Um, and it might, but you know, it might mean removing Japanese knotweed, but it might mean leaving the knotweed, you know, because there's a real conversation that I was I was having with some friends last couple weeks ago about how, like, if you just remove the knotweed, um, even though you're keeping down the invasives, even though you're mowing it and it's not coming back, and you're going to really get rid of it, and then eventually something's going to grow back. You know, the thing is, like, those invasive plants are attracted to uh depleted soil a lot of those invasive plants are growing there because the soil has been so messed up you know and some of them actually like like the question is would it be better to have not weed or nothing because if you're actually going to plant natives and you're going to do this is down here you know what do i have here i have manage invasive species and cultivate natives that's what we're talking about community gardens, food forests, got to make sure that you have access to nature. I could talk about that. But then there's this unclaimed wild space. But this is the point. There needs to be continuous tending. The food forests and the community gardens, there is continuous tending. If there's this unclaimed wild space, that's an opportunity to be managing invasive species, cultivating natives, maybe turning that wild space into community gardens and food forests. But there has to be continuous tending. Because if you just remove it, um, like, First of all, it could it could contribute to uh, something else could just take over. I saw they just cut a bunch of knotweed and now it's just all poison ivy. You know, I don't know which is better. Sometimes you leave the knotweed, maybe the soil's healed. Yeah. Maybe leave it. Sometimes, you know, and Dow Ryan and Beyond the War on Invasive Species, she talks about like pollinators like it. You know, and this isn't like really the greatest reason because I think I'm pretty sure the knotweed was brought here actually to control erosions. I don't know if it's a good reason or a bad reason. It's brought here to control erosion. Now it's escaped. But I have a friend who lives on a riverbank and says that every year there's these giant ice flows, and where the knotweed is, it doesn't get scraped away. Where the knotweed isn't, the riverbank gets all torn up and scraped away. So it might, if you're not going to do continuous tending, you know. It is good to focus on this invasive species and cultivating natives and all this stuff. When you're doing this stuff, I'll just underscore this point, you have to make sure there's community access, right? If it's a, if it's a community program, but it's not welcoming, a lot of times people who look up community programs, they're like, they don't have like community, <laughs> you know? Some people, if you have a group of friends, you don't need to go to singles night, you know? Singles night is for the, people who really need it, you know? So I always think when I'm doing community programs, like I wanna be really welcoming to everybody because everybody who's coming to my community program, they're really hungry for community. And we have to think about the food forests and community gardens, are they accessible across, uh, you know, across socioeconomic or class lines of life, lines of identity? There's this food forest in my neighborhood. I live on Munjoy Hill and, uh, East End of Portland is so interesting. It's gotten really diverse over the past 20 years, which I think is, is good, but it presents a lot of challenges because it's like the richest people in town right here, and then it's like the poorest people in town right here, and the garden is right here. So it is a really good opportunity to be like a meeting place for everybody to come together and build connection, but we have to make sure that we make it welcoming because if it feels elitist, mm -hmm. then they're not going to want to go. So it has to be accessible. There has to be continuous tending. But this is the thing. When it comes to rewilding urban spaces, you know, and I'm going to talk on the next page is really about barriers. And we can just kind of, we don't have to go through each one of these. We can just like look at them. 
ah, you know, and maybe for the people who can't read it, I'll just read that. Um, but there are barriers to rewilding urban spaces because, like, if you're going to let the if you're going to let the plants grow, well, there's a road there. It's like a sidewalk, and there's buildings there. Those people live there, you know. Maybe your neighbors don't want you to. We're talking such a heartbreaking story. We're talking about like no mo may, and maybe maybe the neighbors aren't supportive. The neighbors say, "Mow your lawn. It looks like hell." Ugh. So what it really comes down to is a paradigm shift. And that's why I wrote, this is kind of messy at the bottom, but it says paradigms, think local, regenerative. And so what it really is, is I think that rewilding can be a list of practices like planting plants or making baskets or learning about birds or forest bathing. You know, rewilding can be a lot of things, but it it can be a lot of other things, too. If you're thinking about all of those variable, all those um, varying human societies that had so much difference, you know, another thing that they all had in common is that the community needed the community. You know, there were no human societies of hermits. I mean, the, I don't want to call out the shakers. I don't want to shame. I don't want to be a shaker shamer, but like there's an inherent flaw with the shaker model. You know, it's just it's plain as day. And so community building, community building could be an act of rewilding too, like networking, you know, because if if the global system of avocados in the winter and moving these plants all around and exploiting indigenous people, if we're trying to move away from that, unless we're all going to go back to our racial corners, everybody go back where you come from. It's like completely illogical. I mean, there's a couple people in this room. We probably all come from different places, right? And we're, some of us are like mixes. Hello, it's like thousands of years of evolution. So it's impossible to really go back. What we have to do is take responsible for where we're at. Think local. I mean, I'm not going to move back to where my ancestry is from 5,000 years ago. Then I would be a colonist there. I'm not going to do that. You know, I've, here's my body, my body. I'm here. And so I'm thinking local and I'm trying to do what I can to be a force of regeneration. So whether I'm doing ecologically based things, whether I'm challenging socio-political structures, whether I'm teaching people, what I'm doing is teaching these place-based nature skills. So I'm doing a lot of nature stuff, but that doesn't mean that the nature stuff is rewilding or rewilding has to be nature stuff because you could be, as long as you're trying to kind of, what was your name? Sorry, sir. Dennis. Dennis. Yeah. Right. So just like what you were saying about kind of tapping into that nature, the wild nature and, you know, am I being a force for good? Am I helping? Am I helping what the earth's will is to to do? Am I helping be regenerative? Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be like hands in the dirt. Do you also do uh, terra preta? I don't know what that is. Terra preta. What is that? Uh, terra preta. It means uh, it's a Portuguese word that means uh, brown earth. Okay. What is it? It means brown earth. Brown earth. And they found that the indigenous uh, uh, culture down in the Amazon, uh, they had used. Uh, they found that charcoal when mixed with. Uh, uh, different types of organic matter actually gave life to the soil. And that's how they were able to sustain their culture. I mean, there's a lot there. It's a, uh, is it nitrogen in charcoal? A lot of nitrogen, right? So yeah, I mean, no, putting actually, no, carbon. No. Carbon. It's just, carbon, it's just yeah, carbon. carbon. It's, it's, I don't know what the hell's it's going it. on in there. All right, so <laughs> I mean, putting charcoal in the soil or putting wood ash in the soil is definitely a huge thing that a lot of people around the world have done. I'll try, I think I only have two well, I have three more slides. This one is really quick, though, and this just goes without saying. So I'm just going to read them. This is the barriers to rewilding that should be acknowledged. You know, there's land ownership. So if you're just thinking ecological, you have to take responsibility for the laws and politics. Can you plant? Is it even legal? Sometimes on a uh, public land, even though it's invasive knotweed, you're not supposed to cut stuff. And the knotweed, you know, if you cut it, you're not supposed to leave it on the ground because it can reroot. So you have to would cut it and remove it, which is now you're breaking a law. Some of us are busy. We don't have the time. We have to work. 
You know, we have to spend money. Sometimes we think about mutual aid organizations or like creating kind of networks of supportive networks. Like those are the, the, the mutual aid networks are there. The, the framework is there. You know, it's just that all of our, our resources are kind of funneled back towards, uh, towards the state, you know, so through, we have to pay rent and stuff. So we could be sharing our resources, but there's kind of this framework that's been set up that we have to acknowledge. We can't like fairy tale pretend our way out of it. On that note, there's toxins and disease. I mean, the whole world just had a slap in the face with the COVID. You know, we have to make make sure that we can't just go and like start drinking the water like dances with wolves, feeling the magic. You know, there's this real stuff that has to be acknowledged here. And so uh, part of rewilding, I think, and that's why like. Maybe you're going to be an environmental lawyer. That's rewilding. That has nothing to do with like nature connection, really, but it is kind of helping reestablish wildness in, in Earth and in society. And sometimes I think that there's a lack of desire or there's the superego. You know, the superego is like the voice of society, like the voice of your neighbor that's like shaming you or making fun of you or you feel silly. I wrote this down before we had this conversation. I didn't write this for you. You know what I mean? <laughs> I wrote this down before we had that talk. So, but I was thinking like, sometimes there are like people are like, well, hot showers. I love, I really like hot showers, you know? And it's like, that's why I don't care about, you know, it's, and it shouldn't have to be a trade-off, but sometimes it is. So worth noting that because of those barriers, this is like the bottom line. It's hard to read, but I, I used to have it printed on business cards. Industrial civilization is inherently unsustainable and exploitative. Class, these are the facts, right? So it's, uh, it's worth debating, you know, but uh, I'm going to stand by it at the end of the day. Oh, yeah. It's been a long debate. So worth noting. If industrial civilization is inherently unsustainable and exploitative, what are the alternatives, first of all, what's the alternative to industrial civilization? I would say rewilding. Yeah. And it's like localization, developing local communities, building your local economy, uh, healing the land and each other. What are the alternatives to rewilding? Like continuing along this path? It's basically only one, what I call technotopia, or going to outer space. And I think. Dumb idea. And also it's very sad for all the poor people who will not be able to afford to go to outer space. Mm -hmm. And even when you go to outer space, boy, it's going to suck. <laughs> it's going to be very boring and you're going to be just like Wally. Just go and watch. Have you seen that, Wally? Yeah. 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 Okay. So some people say, is it natural? You know, of course, the evolution. Can I go? Oh, okay. can I go five minutes over? Oh, you can go. Yeah. This is the last slide. No, okay, right. so um, so some people say, is it natural? You know, they'll say like, well, it had to happen this way because if it didn't have to happen this way, and if it wasn't going to happen this way, then it wouldn't have happened this way. So if, if it's very frustrating, but I have these two stories for you, uh, Wendy, that hopefully will make you feel better: the monks and the J Dubs, J Ws. So people say, uh, you know, even if we rewild or like somehow build the local economy and end civilization or whatever and build some new harmony uh eventually we're going to pick up the pieces and start doing the exploitative global movement kind of steal from your neighbor like enslave people and all the horrible i can't even, it's like you can't even mention the things that were commonplace to build everything like rape you know but it can't, it's like, I don't even want to say that word. I like feel dirty like saying it. And yet there was a lot of raping in colonial movements. And here we are hundreds of years later, you know, not that long, even 500 years later. It's like, oh, we don't do that anymore, you know? So it's very uncomfortable to mention, but I think it's kind of connected to the whole thing because what we're what we're questioning is like, domination over the earth and domination over each other and like if it was all natural then like the crusades were natural and like the salem witch trials were natural and like all deforestation of the amazon rainforest is natural and assimilation of all the native peoples into the walmart fluorescent lights lost in the supermarket you know is natural 
And maybe it is natural. But there's two stories. So this first is the story of these two monks. Um, they go into a bar. <laughs> right. No figuring. Oh, no, it's actually the monk. It's only one monk, I think. It's like there's the monk and then there's the warlord, the conqueror. So there's the monk who's meditating and he's meditating there on the mountaintop. And then the warlord comes along and is conquering. And uh, everybody who gets conquered by the warlord, they're like cowering in terror. And the warlord goes and conquers, then spreads his warlord empire, then goes to the monk. But the monk is unafraid. And the warlord takes out his sword and puts it to the neck of the monk. And he says, monk is not afraid. And the warlord says, aren't you afraid? Don't you realize that I am the type of man who could cut off your head without blinking an eye? And the monk looks at him and says, don't you realize I'm the type of man who could have his head cut off without blinking an eye? And it's supposed to be like a story about like turning the other cheek or whatever. But then I think like, then he cut the monk's head off and then he made more warlords. Mm. So it's kind of two ways to interpret the story. One is like the monk was a cool guy. He sat there and took it, got his head cut off. The other is like, come on, monk. Now is the time to maybe not, if you're so fearless, then be fearless, but don't, don't just sit there and take it, take it. Mm. So yes, it might be natural. You know, the conquering might be natural, but the resistance to the conquering is natural as well, which brings me to the story of the JWs, which are these Jehovah's Witnesses who used to come to my house all the time. And I would invite them in because I thought they were a lot of fun to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> and they were really, really willing to talk. And so for somebody who likes to talk, it's like, oh, friends, come on in, we'll make some tea. And uh, I, I had this really interesting point with them where they, they said, um, the, they said, it's, I was basically talking to them about the problems of civilization. I said, but look, civilization is wicked. We're killing the earth. We're killing God's earth. And they said, God will save us. And I, it's kind of like that joke. You know that joke where the guy's drowning? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know that? Does everybody know that? It's worth telling. The guy's drowning. And uh, there's, also, there's also stages before that. Oh, with, really? With a name, he hears it on the news that the, the water is going to rise, and the neighbor comes over and says, Hey, you need to get out of there. We're evacuating. Oh, and there's even more than that. Me, and then it, there's it, different ones. I heard yeah. the guy's drowning, and then they, 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 uh, they throw the life preserver, but he says, God's going to save me. And then they go over in a rowboat and they try to get him in, but he says, No, God's going to save me. And then they bring the rescue helicopter and he says, God's going to send, and he drowns. And then he goes to God and says, why didn't you save me? And God says, what the hell are you talking about? I sent the boat. I sent yeah, the right. helicopter. I sent the life preserver. So I would say to the Jehovah's Witnesses, God is going to save the world through us. God, it's like, ding, hello. <laughs> we're the ones who are going to do it. We're Ferlinghetti. We are the ones we've been waiting for, right? So it might be natural, but that doesn't mean that there's any less reason for us to focus all of our energy on regeneration, healing, connection, peace, generosity, curiosity, calmness, connection, regeneration, connection, learning, curiosity, resting, back to the cycle again, you know? And this last thing is about the oxygenation event, which is such a frustrating thing where people say, you know, the six mass extinction you know what the first mass extinction was? You know, now we got the sixth mass extinction. You know about that? We're killing everything. Everything. Yeah. Everything's dying. Okay, so we got this sixth mass extinction, but the first mass extinction was the oxygenation event when all of the cyanobacteria died, and it was the birth of oxygen, and it was the beginning of something new. And some people say, well, maybe civilization is killing the planet. And that's the beginning of something new. And this is just our ultimate purpose. And I think the beginning of something new is coming from our spirit. And that's what's going to create the next oxygenation event. So 
Sometimes when we think about really what rewilding looks like, it's so place-based, it's so specific, it's so based on the needs of your place. Rewilding Portland, Maine is gonna look different from rewilding different. different parts of places. So what it really comes down to is rewilding humanity, yes. rewilding society. And it's about these things, meeting the needs of everybody on an ecological regenerative basis. And I've got this thing, the sacred six which is the sacred four is the order of survival, the things that you need to survive in the woods, the things that you would die immediately without. Shelter, then you need water, fire, food. But then I always add it to six. Some people say PMA, positive mental attitude, you know, and then you need your iPhone. Yes. You but I think it's shelter, water, fire, food, music, community. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to just say these two things and then I'll answer your question. I just wanted, because I feel like I've gone over already, but this idea of building the new economy, it could be many things. It could be time sharing. It could be mutual aid. It could be um, land trust. It could be finding somebody to garden in your garden if you don't have the energy to garden or something. So we just have to think about what the new economy is. Um, It really comes down to praxis and sharing. Everything is praxis and sharing. But this just says justice, social and economic. And I just think it's worth mentioning and maybe even ending on this point. And I'll just end by saying praxis and sharing again. But the social and economic justice is just to acknowledge that this is kind of inherently a political movement. And a lot of people say that rewilding is just about deep nature connection. And I think that deep nature connection is great. And a lot of what rewild Maine does is living skills, craft classes, nature connection, which is part of rewilding, right? Um, but it's not like, rewilding is not just nature stuff. Rewilding is an acknowledgement of all of those barriers. Rewilding is an acknowledgement of how industrial civilization for 10,000 years, and I don't have the time to debate this point or to de defend it rather, but the thesis of my talk basically is that Civilization goes against the wild nature of humanity and wild spaces. And so there's something inherently political about calling for social justice, economic justice, so that people have equal access to, to wild spaces and nature and all that, uh, that makes rewilding inherently political. So rewilding humanity, really it says paradigm shift on the other page, but really it's about, like all of this stuff is about praxis, doing the work of planting the plants, making the crafts, meeting the people, doing the lobbying, litigation, hosting events or whatever, do the praxis to actually build community and regenerate natural systems and focus on sharing. Because that's how we survived for three million years was sharing. And now it's just like, well, I got my bank account. So, you know, you're on your own. So I think that the more we focus on regenerative praxis and sharing and acknowledging the barriers that come with living in an urban space, then we can begin to explore the action items, which might be as simple as planting plants. And that's, that's my take on rewilding urban spaces. Yeah. Thanks, Phyllis. Did you have another question, Dennis? Oh, I have tons of questions. Do we, do we have time or what do you think? I know that we said we were supposed to be an hour. You said it was 40 minutes with 20 minutes of questions. And now I talk for an hour and 10 minutes, basically. It's all good. If, um, if we go for like another 10 minutes, it's fine. We'll do a few few yeah. questions or whatever. And then. Sure. And thank you so much for coming, all of you. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank, thank you. Awesome. When you were talking about economics, OK, with uh, um, OK, say if something happened, the uh, we don't have access to our bank accounts. The the entire system is the grid goes down. The grid yeah. goes down. Okay, um, uh, we go back to well, can't go back to a barter system because yeah. What would you do today yeah. if the lights went out forever? Exactly. Well, I don't know. What would you do? Very good question. Uh, I think I would I would start with the uh, the three. Is it the, uh, the the law of three? You have three minutes without air. Three minutes without uh, three days without 
Right. That's that sacred okay. six, right? Yeah. You have yeah. Three minutes without air, three hours without shelter, if it's freezing. Yeah. Three days without food, food I think. Or three, water. Without oh, without water. water. But no, of course, shelter, water, shelter, water. Water comes even before fire or food, and food comes last because you can go like three weeks without exactly. food. Yeah. And then you can go three months without a social connection. And you can go three years without... And then you have to think about the spark of inspiration, yeah. the animality. Oh, I, think, that the animality? I don't know of, of humans. It's like, uh, what would we do? I think that that's a huge question. And I think that like how to survive if the grid goes down is part of it. I mean, this is an interesting thing that I'll just say about prepping is a lot of times when we think about like prepping doomsday prepping and even these survival shows like alone or naked and afraid or all that. And even survival books. A lot of the understanding of survival and prepping is like making it through the uncivilized time to get back to civilization, to get rescued by the helicopter, or to get the lights to turn on again. But I think, you know, what would we do to, to what would we do right now if the lights went out forever? Probably we might even panic. Like a lot of people would panic. There are a lot of people whose lives, you know, verily depend on electricity at this moment the, the lights went out at the hospital a lot of people would be screwed but i think that um rather than thinking about it from like a prepping like when the grid goes down what do we do there's so much more opportunity to think about like um and i'm not saying that the, you know i'm not saying that like uh like the amish you know the un, i was going to say amish but Living without electricity is not an answer for everything, but it is exciting to imagine, you know, people lived without electricity for millions of years, and we might have to do that again. But they were prepared for it, though. I mean, over... Let's prepare. Gen generations. Right. I mean, it's like... We should prepare over generations. We should start now. Right. With, I mean, you know, so yeah. We should prepare. I'm going to live with you guys. <laughs> Because I know you'll know how to cook and do stuff. <laughs> yeah, it is about as long as we have not weed leather. Not weed fruit leather. That's what we're gonna yeah. eat. That's what we'll eat for the rest of our days and acorns. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, any other questions? Um, the recipe for the not weed Japanese not weed fruit leather. Yeah. So I'll just say about not weed that some people treat it like asparagus. And I think it's better if you think of it like rhubarb. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some people just cook the whole thing and treat it like asparagus. Yeah. But I think you should just think about the stalk as rhubarb. You it's like almost too late for knotweed now because you right. really need to be yeah. tender. So if it's not tender when so it's it like pops, inch. yeah, right now you'll only get lucky maybe with the tops of it, but it has to say good pop. Okay. And if you try to break it and it just crunches, it's too fibrous. It's too tough. You'll have to wait till next year. But if you get it when it's when it's tender, you don't need the leaves, just the stalk. Oh, just the stalk. Yeah, like rhubarb, just the stem. Eat the, the leaves as the little tender top you can eat. But once the leaves have opened up, and I don't think it's a toxin issue. I think it's just I was taught to just eat the stalk. I don't want you to quote me on the toxin. I think it's we should, you know, one of the things that Rewild Maine is it's like collective education. Yeah, right, right. I'm not the expert. <laughs> that way I don't have to be the expert on everything. But the recipe is essentially just get the stalks of knotweed, chop them into chunks, put them in a pot with water, just like applesauce. And you can dehydrate any type of fruit sauce in a dehydrator, or you could do like Chris and Ashira said, and uh Spread it out on glass. He has a song with it. <laughs> I don't put it in the context. <laughs> yeah, just dry it on a glass window pane and you can make fruit leather. Cool. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. And um, of course, you can let me know if you have any questions. And uh, anybody who's listening, the uh, the door is always open for further discussion about the, the complex uh, concept of rewilding. Thanks Thank for listening. You.